By way of disclosure, I am a patent holder for SNP-based uh, technologies, uh, stockholder and chief medical officer of Stratified Genomics. Uh, our objectives are modest. In the next 10 minutes, I'm going to be uh, trying to explain the difference between germline and somatic genomic classifiers of prostate cancer risk, understand the difference between high penetrance and low penetrance genetic tests, and get a better sense of implications of these different tests on our patients. So somatic mutations, uh, this baffles many who are bombarded with all of these genetic tests in their clinic. Somatic mutations or genetic alterations are changes within the cancer-containing tissue which enable malignant growth and alter outcome. Germline are genetic changes which can predispose an individual to prostate cancer and are typically heritable. I see typically. So in terms of germline markers of heritable prostate cancer risk, High penetrance markers are more mutations. These are, by definition, rare events, typically occurring in less than 5% of the population, typically encoding DNA, resulting in a biologic change which has an, uh, an impact on cancer outcome. These are associated not just with cancers, but with more aggressive cancers. Low penetrance markers, on the other hand, are often referred to as single nucleotide polymorphisms. Each of these confer a lower amount of risk, are typically in non-coding DNA, but rather than the small percent of the, of the population where the high penetrance mutations have a role in, these are applicable to 100% of the population. So really those germline markers are, are appropriate to define the population of who may benefit from screening. In terms of high penetrance markers, this seminal paper out of uh, University of Washington and others uh, really highlights the prevalence of these genetic mutations, so these high penetrance genetic changes conferring risk to disease. Twelve percent of men with metastatic patients in this study, five percent of men with localized disease, and three percent of men without prostate cancer were known to have these mutations. So these uh, mutations, there are many of them in many different genes, and there are a bunch of different tests out there, so it's a bit confusing about which test to use in which setting. But the bottom line in terms of screening, these tests are typically run on individuals with multiple affected family members in whom annual screening would per be performed in any case. So really, it's, it's a bit of a problem to, to have actionable screening information based on it, but as Dan mentioned, you may be more willing to pull the trigger in terms of treatment, and obviously this has implications on family members, which I'll get into a little bit later. Well, what about the role of low penetrant markers? Back in 2008, we uh, identified several of these markers, packaged them together, and were able to identify a population of men at extremely high risk, tenfold higher risk based on these five markers. Really a proof of principle because, again, only one to two percent of the population fit in here. Subsequently, we locked our test in at about the 30 SNP mark, and uh, we validated it in over 100,000 patients now in some of the most important prostate cancer uh, screening studies and other studies performed including the prostate cancer prevention trial, reduced PLCO, and we just received serum samples from the Rotterdam cohort of the ERSPC, so we're pretty excited about that. Now, this, the magic number, Dave has his 1.5, I'll have my 0 0.6. So 0 0.6 is a very important number as far as a PROM score. This has a sensitivity for overall and high-grade cancer of about 84%. If we look at those randomized controlled trials, be it prostate cancer prevention trial or the reduced trial. Negative predictive value, very high at 97 percent, again for aggressive cancers in both of those trials. Sensitivity, at least for metastatic disease in a single uh, study, 94 percent, and approximately 40 percent of tests run to date have had a PSA less than zero, uh, a prompt score less than 0 0.6. So, the prostate cancer prevention trial. 
largest screening uh, chemo prevention trial ever performed, where men were randomized to receive finasteride or placebo. The placebo arm of this study was really important because men who were felt to be at low risk were followed frequently. And those men who were not diagnosed with prostate cancer over a seven year period underwent a study mandated prostate biopsy at year seven. So this allows us in an unbiased fashion to look at various biomarkers. So if we were to screen every man every year in this study, you'd have 8,300 screening events to detect 38% of cancers. If you only screen those men with a family history, you'd drop the screening events down to 1,000, but you'd only be diagnosing 19% of all high-grade cancers. But with a risk-stratified approach using the PROMPT test, if you were to forego screening in those men who are at low risk and focus your screening efforts on those men at average and high risk, you'd yield only 3,000 screening events to detect almost half of the high-grade cancers. So a pretty efficient way of going through things. Obviously, Dave's less than uh, 1.5 worked extremely well, dropping the number of screening events down to 1856, but would miss out on a lot of those higher-grade cancers. Now, fast-forwarding on who to biopsy, not an easy decision. There's the IntelliScore. We haven't talked much about that uh, today, but it's a three-gene exosome RNA-based signature uh, popularized by McKiernan. Select MDX we talked about, Confirm we talked about in great detail. I just want to spend a couple minutes here on these three genetic tests that we're using to identify those patients who we could potentially back off in terms of, of treatment. There's the Oncotype Genomic Prostate Score. This is a 17-gene array, the Decipher from Genome DX and the Prolaris Test by Myriad. They establish a predictive score based on expression of a varying number of genes together with clinical and pathologic variables. They require slides of the highest grade biopsy core given the multifocality of prostate cancer. This is a problem, and it's an Achilles heel of this technology, and that was an excellent slide that, that Jerry put out before. Now, what are we trying to achieve here? I mean, Lori did such a wonderful job with this active surveillance cohort, and we're looking at, with the very strict criteria of 94 to 99.9% .9 15-year cancer-specific survival. I don't know how we're going to beat that. So really, for men with very low risk disease, I, I don't think there's much of a role for this kind of expensive testing, um, unless you don't trust your pathologist, or unless you have that very anxious patient in front of you who you want to reassure. The Oncotype uh, DX array, I want to just point out the fact that these are outcomes on men following radical prostatectomy. So we're trying to make conclusions on men on active surveillance in a group of men who've been treated. Uh, so I think it's very important when we look at tests, we see how they've been developed and validated. The Decipher test, same thing. Only the Prolaris test by Myriad uh, was validated on conservatively managed patients. So this is really the most important thing, in my opinion. Is, is really looking at that group of patients that you're making that treatment decision on and choosing the appropriate test. Now it's confusing and you can see that there are various results resulting in all of these different tests. So as far as the current landscape for genetic testing in prostate cancer, you can see that for screening, we're really left with low penetrant and high penetrant t testing. For biopsy, EPI, select MDX, confirm MDX, and for treatment, you can see below here. So genomic risk stratification is a powerful biomarker. All the tests are well validated but have their strengths and weaknesses, and you make, have to make sure of the indications before proceeding. 